And Moshe said, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart, and you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom to everyone worshiping with us at home. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're going to talk about something today. I'm going to revisit a message that I, I gave about three years ago. Uh, got a few little twists in it. We, um, uh, we, we talked recently about some things concerning uh, Hebraic thought and, and remez and sowed and peshat and all those kind of things. And we also talked about how, how uh, uh, in, in Christianity we also did some of the same type of of understanding, we just called it spiritualizing, and we also we also uh, talked about how just because you've got a Hebraic mindset doesn't mean that you necessarily come to the proper or righteous conclusion. Amen. And just want to keep that in mind as we as we go over over this today, because there are uh, there there are some people who who claim to have a Hebraic mindset who are actually using some old Christian. Remez in their in their understanding. Some people would say that's that's a contradiction in terms. But we're going to get with it. One of the reasons that I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about this today is is because we've added so many people to the DVD outreach ministry program uh, since three years ago, and many of them may not have had an opportunity to examine what we are going to be discussing today. You see, I'm going to be talking about something today that will challenge you to examine yourself to see whether you have some unscriptural ideas that you picked up from Christianity. Things that may be floating around in the belief system that uh, you may not have recognized. Because after all, most of us came out of Christianity. I mean, and uh, before we get very far into the message, I want to talk a little bit about preachers and elders, and more specifically, our responsibility to teach the word of Yahweh to the people. Because that is, after all, the responsibility of a minister. Amen? Let's, look, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to start reading in verse 1. It says, And the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people. And you shall say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land shall take a man from their borders, and shall make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming uh, upon the land, and shall blow the ram's horn, and shall warn the people, then... Whoever shall hear the sound of the ram's horn and shall not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood is on his own head. He heard the sound of the ram's horn, but he did not take warning. His blood is on himself. But he who takes warning shall deliver his being. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and shall not blow the ram's horn and the people shall not be warned and the sword comes and takes any being from among them, he is taken away in his crookedness, and, and his blood I require at the watchman's hand. You are not absolved from your crookedness. The sword still comes, but the watchman is held accountable for your blood as well. Have you ever listened to ministers stand up and, and uh, use a couple of passages from Scripture out of context? to do away with all of the evidence that clearly points to the contrary. Have you ever done that, seen that? It's kind of like, it's kind of like when, when we've talked about before about they want you to believe in this transparent illusion veiled in a smoke screen, and they don't want you to pay any attention to that man behind the curtain. Remember that? A great example of this is when, when Yahweh says that the Sabbath is an everlasting covenant. A sign between him and his people. 
It was observed by Yahshua Messiah and his taught ones after his death and resurrection. And you have all of the evidence and examples for Sabbath keeping. But some preachers who hate the thought of bringing himself into compliance with the Sabbath will maintain that since Paul said in Romans 14, 5, one indeed judges one day above another, another judges every day alike. Let each one be completely persuaded in his own mind. And in Colossians 2, 16, let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come, but the body of the Messiah and whammo. According to him, all of a sudden, the Sabbath, the everlasting covenant and sign between Yahweh and his people, which Yahshua and all of his taught ones kept, including Paul, and which will be observed in the kingdom, according to Ezekiel, all of a sudden, it's not binding for believers today. Isn't that interesting? And some will even teach that it is offensive to the Heavenly Father if we don't forsake the Sabbath and keep Sunday. Because, as they erroneously teach, that's the Lord's day. And if you don't observe Sunday instead of the Sabbath, then you are not giving Yahshua the honor that he deserves. What do you think? Are these preachers teaching the people to do away with the clear instructions of Yahweh? How about you folks at home? Yahweh says the Sabbath is an everlasting covenant. Yahshua kept it as taught ones, and it will be observed in his coming kingdom. But these guys pull a couple of verses out of context and simply twist the scriptures to make it say what they want. Who are you going to believe? The guy that says, keep the Sabbath, or the one who says don't? Would you agree with me that these guys are teaching a doctrine while standing on no scriptural authority? Yeah. I didn't say they weren't standing on any scripture. I said they weren't standing on scriptural authority. Oh, they're standing on scripture all right. As a matter of fact, they're standing on it, and they're trampling all over it. They do the same thing with the unclean meats, the feast days, circumcision, the name, you name it. Yahweh commands one thing, but you can find a preacher somewhere that will say that you don't have to keep that or just about any command that you might find in the word of Yahweh. Amen? The really sad thing to me is that there are ministers not in, the, not in the Christian church, but who claim to be Nazarenes who are going about in the congregations of Yahweh and on the internet and other places who are doing the exact same thing to the word of Yahweh. I believe that there's several reasons why these folks are doing these things, but most of all, I believe that they are so entrenched in certain aspects of Christian doctrine and dogma that they have thus far been able to shake themselves from its grip. It's that easy. Turn with me to 1 John, chapter 2. Matt wanted me to say they were standing on it and wiping their feet on it. First John chapter 2, starting in verse 3, it says, And by this we know that we know that him, if we guard his commands, the one who says, I know him, and does not guard his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever guards his word, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he stays in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. 
Verse 4 says, The one that says, I know him and does not guard his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. All right? Stan didn't say that. John said that. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, and we look at this from time to time, but it's especially relevant to today's message. Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to tell me if this seems like clear instruction from Yahshua, what we're going to read here. Matthew 5, starting in verse 17. Do not think that I, who is I here? Yeshua. all right. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. Does that sound like a command? Does that sound like clear instruction right there? Telling you not, telling you not to think something. That's the thing that he's telling you not to do, is not to think something. I did not come to destroy but to complete. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. All right, now, we have discussed in the past about how this command pertains to the heart and the mind. It's a command that Yahshua, uh, from Yahshua, by Yahshua to abstain from thinking thinking a particular thing. Amen? Can somebody tell me what particular thing that Yahshua is commanding us not to think? That he, that he came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. Is that hard to understand? Folks at home. Yet there are ministers, Nazarene ministers, who think and teach that he did indeed do away with or change certain parts of the Torah. But Yahshua said, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Now, does doing away with and changing the Torah sound like it is destroying and making jots and tittles pass from the Torah? Yeah. That's not hard either, is it? Okay, Yahshua commanded us not to think that he came to destroy the Torah of the prophets, one jot or tittle, no means passed, the law be done. If we say then that he did change things and do away with things, would we be obeying his command not to think that he came to do away with the Torah of the prophets? All right? Do you remember what John said? 1 John 2, 4. The one who says, I know him and does not guard his commands as a liar, and the truth is what? Not in him. But we have ministers running around saying, oh, but he did. Kind of makes you wonder, huh? Again, not Stan. What does John say about not just ministers, but anyone who, who, who says that they know Yahshua and does not keep his commands? A liar. a liar. And the truth's not in them. And that's harsh, isn't it? And that's true, isn't it? <laughs> and Yahshua says something even more condemning. In verse 19 of Matthew 5, he says, Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do uh, other teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the, of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. All right. Who wants to be called least in the reign of the heavens? There's no hands up here in the congregation. I hope there aren't any up at home. If you do, you probably need to come visit. We'll have a talk. <laughs> Next point. 
It's just one verse, but I'd like to turn everyone to turn to, to Psalms 19. And if, and if it's not, there, there's two verses in, in today that I especially would like for you to highlight. This is one of them. If it's not, it's not highlighted in your scriptures. Psalms 19. And I'm waiting until everybody gets there because I uh, won't be reading any further for you to catch up. All right? Verse 7. The Torah of Yahweh is, what's that next word? Perfect. Bringing back the being. The witness of Yahweh is trustworthy, making wise the simple. Now, any of you who have been studying with us much at all know that, that in Hebrew, the idea of perfect means complete. You are not going to take that which is perfect and make it more perfect or more complete by adding to, taking away, or changing it. I mean, it says the Torah of Yahweh is perfect. Yet there are Nazarene ministers who, contrary to the clear teachings of Yahshua Messiah, take the old Christian attitude that the Torah has been changed or done away with in part. It says in Psalms 19.7, it's perfect. And that's why I call these fellows Nazaristians. All right? I'm hearing some chuckles. Maybe some people haven't heard that, that word. And we need to get it back out there. Nazaristians. Some of these Nazaristians are some of the biggest names in the faith with, with the largest fellowships. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have any good teachings. They do. Some of them have brought many people out of the church and into the truth about many things. But there's a fly in the ointment. And by the way, how many of you people here and at home believe that, that uh, when Paul was called, that part of his ministry was to straighten Yahshua out? Nobody? Paul's ministry was not to straighten Yahshua out. And how many of you believe that Paul had the authority to change things and do away with things? I don't think so. One jot or tittle shall by no means pass from the tort law be done. According to the witness and the testimony of Yahshua Messiah, if Paul had broke the Torah and taught others to break even the least of the commands, what would that make him? Least. Least in the kingdom. He would not be a great apostle. He'd be least in the kingdom. So when people say things have changed or that it's all spiritual now because of Yahshua, we need to remind them that Yahshua said otherwise. And he commanded that we were not even to think such a thing as that. Okay? We're not even to think such a thing. So here we go. We're going to start to examine ourselves to see if we have some unscriptural ideas that we picked up from Christianity floating around in our belief system that we may not have recognized. All right? Where we may be standing on no scriptural authority. Do you suppose that when Yahshua commanded one jot or tittle and he warned about breaking even the least of the commands that this command of Yahshua would apply even more to something when Yahweh didn't just give the command, but, but he, used, he used impressive in particular language like forever, everlasting, throughout your generations. Bind it on your hand, between your eyes, and teach it, teach it to your children after you. If Yahweh deliberately used language like that uh, with a command, do you think that a command like that would very likely carry a little more weight than a jot or a tittle. You'd think. Yahshua said jot and tittle, and yet 
there is a command of Yahweh in which he uses that very same impressive everlasting language that I just described. And it's a command which most people don't keep. Wow. And ministers in the faith who teach the people that the same Yahshua said, do not think such a thing. That very same Yahshua is the reason that they say you do not have to keep this command that Yahweh prescribed everlasting anymore because of Yahshua. Huh? And while standing on no scriptural authority, these ministers even have an unscriptural litmus test. You know what a litmus test is? It's a litmus test that they, they learn in the church in which if a person does keep this command as Yahweh prescribed with all of that impressive language, imperative language, these people who keep the command are publicly condemned for their obedience to Yahweh and said to be anti-Messiah. Really? Huh? And Yahweh's people who in most cases used to be Christians and are already predisposed to this thinking and who have great admiration for these ministers will not question them, much less challenge them with the clear instruction of Yahweh for fear of failing the litmus test and being branded as being anti-Messiah even in their own minds especially in the assemblies, and coming under public scorn. <laughs> when I tell you what this command is, there are some of you who are so indoctrinated with Christianity that you'll likely close your scriptures. I hope you're, I hope you're using your scriptures. You'll likely close your scriptures, get up, turn the TV off, and, and say, don't you ever send me another thing. But before I tell you what it is, I just want to remind you. Do you remember that when we were talking about the Sabbath a little while ago and we agreed that that was a great example of absurdity when Yahweh says that the Sabbath, the Sabbath is everlasting and a covenant uh, signed between him and his people. It was observed by Yahshua Messiah, his taught ones after his death and resurrection and it will be observed in the kingdom and that you have all these evidences and examples for the Sabbath in its eternal per perpetuity, how absurd it is for someone to take some little verse here or there to prove that the Sabbath's been done away with. You remember, you remember we thought that was absurd? Well, they handle this one the exact same absurd way as we will see. But do you know what? Yahweh has a litmus test too. Sure does. Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the endurance of the set-apart ones. Here are those guarding the commands of Elohim in the belief of Yahshua. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are those doing his commands so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life and to enter through the gates into the city. And one more. Exodus 20. Shemot chapter 20 starting in verse 5 he says for I Yahweh your Elohim am a jealous El visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. So whose litmus test do you want to pass? Yahweh's 
or some man's. But what is this perpetual command that you're talking about, Stan? Keep stringing us along. This command that Yahweh said that is to be everlasting, forever, year by year. Left that one out earlier. Year by year, throughout your generations, bound on your hand, between your eyes, talk to your children, in which none of Yahweh's prophets ever said stop doing. And when son Yahshua came, he did it too. And he never instructed us to stop doing it. Neither did he instruct us to do it differently, either in word or deed, and neither did any of his taught ones, including Paul, say to stop doing it. And according to Ezekiel, we'll still be doing it in the coming kingdom. And I've got to ask you, with credentials like that, wouldn't it be just a little absurd to think that a command like that has been done away with? What do you think? Absurd. The command that I speak of is the scriptural observance of Passover and the scriptural reason for its observance. Not the Christian substitute. And their use of Yahshua to do away with it because the church with its strong delusion has turned the Passover into something that Yahweh never intended. Are you surprised? And they taught the people to transgress the commands of Elohim. And there are many of us who have come out of the church, but its teachings still have a strong hold on us. There are those too who believe themselves to have a Hebraic mindset, who have simply turned Christian typology into Hebraic remez. And or sowed or, or, or hidden meaning and use Yahshua to do away with the Torah too. Huh. That's why I've called this message, I didn't tell you what I've called this message, how they remezzed up Passover. How they remezzed up Passover. I'm about to teach you what the scripture has to say about the subject and what it does not say. And if you don't want to know what the scripture says, I recommend that you turn off the TV and vacate the building. The tendency about, among most people today is to insist that the commands concerning the Passover have either been changed or done away with altogether. Anybody relate to that? And contrary to his command to not think such a thing, they use Yahshua as the catalyst through which all of this change and doing away with comes. Now, is that not messed up? The church and even people who teach others how to look at things from a... Notice what I said. The church and even people who teach others how to look at things from a Hebraic perspective have applied imagery and remez or spiritualized things to the point that Torah keepers are accused of minimizing Yahshua's sacrifice and being heretics. Typically the argument centers around two or three incidences recorded in the scripture where Yahshua is referred to as a lamb. All right, so let's look at a couple of those. Revelation 13. And while you're turning to Revelation 13 and we look at these things, I would like to remind you that Yahshua was also referred to as some other things too, like the bread that came down from heaven and the good shepherd. And one of the problems here is people are trying to take a particular metaphor and apply it all the way across everything just to you know just to just to keep it going where it doesn't necessarily apply. Right, Revelation 13:7 and it was given to him 
to fight with the set-apart ones and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. And all those dwelling on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life of the slain lamb from the foundation of the world shall worship him. All right, John chapter 1. All right, that's talking about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All right, John chapter 1. In verse 29 says, On the next day, Yochanan saw Yahshua coming toward him and said, See the Lamb of Elohim who takes away the sin of the world. Did you see that? John viewed Yahshua as the Lamb of Elohim who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 and 35. Again, the following day, Yochanan was standing with two of his taught ones and looking at Yahshua walking, he said, See the Lamb of Elohim. Okay. In the first place, neither of these say anything concerning the instruction about how we are to keep the Torah concerning the Passover. Do they? Do any of these have a reference to Passover? All such beliefs are inferred by men rather than prescribed by Elohim. Secondly, Passover is not even about sin, as we will see. Oh, some people want to try to type it some kind of way, spiritualize it some kind of way, apply some remez understanding of Egypt, etc., etc., but it's not about sin. It was given at Mount Sinai, and it was commanded, I'm sorry, it was given before Sinai, and it was commanded to be everlasting before the priesthood was ever established. Furthermore, there's only one verse in the whole Scripture that says anything at all about Passover and sin in the same sentence. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 9. And this is one of them that you might want to make a note next to. Numbers chapter 9. Verse 13. It says, But the man who is clean and not on a journey and has failed to perform the Passover and has failed to to perform the Passover. That same being shall be cut off from among his people because he did not bring the offering of Yahweh at its appointed time. That man bears his sin. This is the only passage in the whole scripture where it says anything at all about the two together, Passover and sin, and it says that it is a sin not to perform it. Interesting, isn't it? Another popular, popular place to prove that Yahshua did away with the uh, sacrifice is Daniel chapter 9. Let's turn there. Daniel chapter 9. You know, sometimes it's good to hear a matter before you answer it. I mean, and, and we've heard a lot of these things before, I mean. That's what we're answering them today. Daniel 9, starting in verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off and have naught, and the people of a coming prince shall destroy the city and the set-apart place, and the end of it is with a flood and... Uh, um, waster, I can't even see. And waster decreed and fighting until the end, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. 
And in the middle of the week, he shall put an end to slaughtering and meal offering. And on the wing of abomination, he shall lay waste even until the complete end. And, and that which is decreed is poured out on the one who lays waste. Now, Messiah and the coming prince are not the same person. It is the coming prince who puts an end to the slaughtering and, what's the other thing? Meal offerings. And on the wing of abomination lays waste and makes desolate. And unless you spiritualize this somehow, Yahshua did not put an end to the slaughtering and the meal offerings. How can you say such a thing, Stan? Well, that very evening after his death, Guess what they did at the, at the uh, Hekel? They did the evening sacrifice. And the next morning, the morning sacrifice was made. And it happened the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Now some people will say, Oh yeah, but Yahweh didn't accept that anymore. If this were the case, why didn't Yahshua... Why, did he, why uh, uh, didn't Yahshua have uh, Paul instructed about this? You would think that he would have, but let's turn with me to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter And starting in verse 18, it says, And on the following day, Shaul went in with us to Yaakov, and all the elders came. That sounds like these are some guys that are connected, right? And having greeted them, he was relating one by one what Elohim had done among the Gentiles through his service. And when they heard it, they praised the Master, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands of Yehudim there are who have believed, and all are ardent for the Torah. And they have been informed about you that you teach all the Yehudim who are among the Gentiles to forsake, forsake Moshe, saying not to circumcise the children, nor to walk according to, their, to the uh, practices. What is it then? What then is it? They shall certainly hear that you have come, so do this, what we say to you, we have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be cleansed with them and pay their expenses so that they shave their heads and all shall know what they have been informed about you is not so. But that you yourself also walk orderly keeping the Torah. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should keep themselves from what is offered idols and blood and what is strangled and whoring. Then Shaul took the men on the next day and, shaved, uh, and having uh, been cleansed with them, they went into the set-apart place to announce that Yahweh would not accept this offering. Is that what yours says? Went into the set-apart place to announce with them, I mean, to, uh, to announce the completion of the days of separation until the offering should be presented for each one of them. Paul was the kind of man who was not afraid to speak his mind. Can I get an amen? amen. He was in prison, he was beaten, he was stoned for Messiah. Do we think? for just a moment, that he would have kept his mouth shut if he thought there was something wrong with this. I don't think that he would. So, we see here, by the witness of Paul's participation, that the death of Yahshua had not caused the offerings to cease, and Yahweh did accept them. And the second witness, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. This is that book we don't ever read from. Hebrews chapter 8, and starting in verse 4. If indeed 
he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are present tense, there are priests who offer present tense the gifts according to the Torah, who serve present tense a copy and a shadow of the heavenly as Moshe was warned when he was, able, uh, when he was about to uh, make the tent. For he said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. So again, we see offerings being made after Yahshua's death. All right, that's how I can say that he didn't cause the offerings to cease. It is the coming prince of Daniel 9 who puts an end to the slaughtering and meal offering. And on the wings of abomination lays waste and makes desolate. Because Yahshua does not come on the wings of abomination. Amen. Also, note that the author of Hebrews does not condemn this practice. It's just stated matter of fact. They're making offerings. Because, uh, uh, oh, another note. Is, isn't it a little inconsistent to say that because Yahshua is the lamb now, we don't slaughter the Passover anymore because he did away the slaughterings and the meal offerings, and then turn right around and eat unleavened bread. When we take the bread, which is meal, and the wine at Passover, do you see the inconsistency in that? If he did away with the slaughter and meal offering, then you shouldn't be eating unleavened bread at Passover either. I mean, can't have it both ways. Exodus chapter 12. Let's get into the meat of this. <laughs> I've been writing that joke for weeks. Just kidding. <laughs> one. <clears throat> Exodus 12, verse 1. <clears throat> and Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This month is the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of the year for you. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, each one of them is to take for himself a lamb according to the house of his fathers, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take according to the number of the beings, according to each man's need you make your count for the lamb. Let the lamb be a perfect one, a year old male. Take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then, what's that next word? All. All the assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. It what? The lamb. The lamb, the lamb or the goat. Kill it. Between the evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses wherever they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with it bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw or boiled it all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its inward parts, and do not leave of it until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you are to burn with fire. And this is how you eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of Yahweh. Understand why we're putting emphasis on it now. It is the Passover of Yahweh. And I shall pass through the Lamb of Mitzrayim on that night and shall smite all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both man and beast. And on all the mighty ones of Mitzrayim, I shall execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I shall pass over you and let the plague not come on you to destroy you when I smite the land of Mitzrayim. And this day shall become to you a remembrance, and you shall observe it as a festival to Yahweh your Elohim. 
throughout your generations. Observe it as a festival, an everlasting law. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Indeed, on the first day you cause leaven to cease from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that being shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day is, the set, is a set-apart gathering. And on the seventh day you have a set-apart gathering. No work at all is done on them. Only that which is eaten by every being, that alone is prepared by you. And you shall guard the festival of unleavened bread, for on the same day I brought uh, your divisions out of the land of Mitzrayim, and you shall guard this day throughout your generations an everlasting law. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month in the evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses, for if anyone eats what is leaven, that same being shall be cut off from among from the congregation of Israel, uh, whether sojourner or native of the land. Do not eat that which is leavened. In all your dwellings you are to eat unleavened bread. And Moshe called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Go out and take lambs for yourselves. According to your clans, slaughter the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is on, in the basin, and strike the lintel of the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And you, none of you, shall go out of the door of his house until morning. And Yahweh shall pass on to smite the Mitzrites, and shall see the blood on the lintel on the two doorposts. And Yahweh shall pass over the house and not allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. And you shall guard this word as a law for you and your sons forever. And it shall be that when you come into the land, okay, not just for now, but even later on, when you come into the land, you keep on doing this, which Yahweh gives you as he promised, that you shall guard this service, and it shall be when your children say to you, what does this service mean to you? Then you shall say, it is because I will send my son to die on the stake to atone for your sins. Is that what yours says? Are you sure? Mine doesn't either. And it shall be when your children say to you, what does this service mean to you? That you shall say it, there's that word again, is the Passover slaughtering of Yahweh who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Mitzrayim when he smote the Mitzrites and delivered our household. And the people bowed their heads and did obeisance. Question, this is a no-brainer. Since the Torah clearly says that we are supposed to teach our children that Passover is about Yahweh passing over the houses of the children of Israel when he smote the Mitzrites and delivered our households, if we tell them something different, are we teaching them something contrary to what the Torah says we are to teach them? Yes, we are. I told you this was a no-brainer, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> what if we teach them, but now the Passover is about Yahshua dying for our sins. Are we teaching them something different than what the Torah clearly says that we are to teach them? Verse Chapter 12, verse 28. And the children of Yisrael went away and did so as Yahweh had commanded Moshe and Aharon. So they did. Skip down to verse 41. And it came to be at the end of 430 years that the same day, on that same day, uh, it came to be that all the divisions of Yahweh went out from, of the land of Mitzrayim. And this night is to be observed unto you for bringing them out of the land of Mitzrayim. This night is unto Yahweh to be observed by all children of Israel, all the children of Israel throughout their generations. And Yahweh said to Moshe in Aharon. Now note that this is future tense, what we're about to read. This is the law of the Passover over. No son of a stranger is to eat of it, but any servant, a man 
who is bought for silver, when you have circumcised him, then let him eat of it. A sojourner and a hired servant does not eat of it. It is eaten in one house. You are not to take any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel is to perform it. And when a stranger sojourns with you and shall perform the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised. And then let him come near and perform it. And he shall be as a native of the land, but let no circumcised eat of it. There's one Torah for the native born and for the stranger who sojourns among you. And all of the children of Yisrael did as Yahweh commanded Moshe and Aharon, so they did. And it came to be on that same day that Yahweh brought the children of Yisrael out of the land of Mitzrayim according to their divisions. 13 verse 1. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Set apart to me all the firstborn, the one opening the womb, among the children of Yisrael, among man and among beast, it is mine. And Moshe said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery, for by strength of hand, Yahweh brought you out of this place. And whatever is leavened shall not be eaten. Today you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Kenyanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hewites, and the Yebuzites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month, seven days you eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day is a festival to Yahweh. Unleavened bread is not to be eaten the seven days, and whatever is leavened is not to be seen with you. And leaven is not to be seen with you within all your borders. And you shall perform, I'm sorry, you shall inform your son in that day, saying, It is because of what Yahweh did for me when I came up from Mitzrayim, and it shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder between your eyes that the Torah of Yahweh is to be in your mouth. Does this sound a little familiar, this, this talk about it's a sign on your hand and between your eyes? kind of sounds like the Shema, doesn't it, what we say at the beginning of the message. All right. So the same language is being applied to the Passover here. For with a strong hand, Yahweh's brought you out of Mitzrayim. Brothers and sisters, this is what Passover is about. Okay? Did we see that? This is what Passover is about. And this is what Yahweh says we are to tell our children. It's only because of the constraints of time that we're not going to read all the passages in our study today. Uh, I am, however, going to give you all the references that you can write them down where you can look them up at home. I never want to tell you anything contrived or, script or scripturally incorrect. That would not advance the reign of Elohim. I'm going to turn into dirt one of these days, and I'll be over. Okay, I'm interested in advancing the reign of Elohim, and I don't want your blood to be on my head because I didn't sound the ram's horn and warn you that the sword was coming. Always check out what I say to you. And you know what? If I'm in error... I need to come in compliance with the word of Yahweh, not the other way around. Amen? Amen, amen. Here are the passages where there are instructions concerning the Passover. You want to write them down. Exodus chapter 12 and 13 and 34 verse 25. Leviticus 23, verse 4. Numbers 9, 1 through 14. By the way, this is, this is where uh, in the second year after coming out of Mitzrayim, we see Yisrael performing the Passover. All of those? I'll give them to you, I'll give them to you after the message. The people on the 
outreach can rewind it. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, this is this is the second. This is in the second year after the coming out of Mitzrayim. We see Israel performing the Passover. Um, this is where we find out that it is so important to Yahweh that He gives us a second opportunity to perform it. Should we be unclean? This is also where we learn that a man would bear his sin for not performing it. All right. Also, Numbers 28, verse 16, Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 7, and Ezekiel 45, 21. Now, here are the passages where there are examples of people keeping the Passover. Exodus chapter 12 and 13, Numbers 9, 1 through 14, Joshua 5, 10 and 11, chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 21 through 23, 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and 35, Ezra chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, and Hebrews 11, 23 through 28. And please forgive me if I overlooked any of them. Uh, it wasn't intentional. All right. Now, next I'd like to look at Yahshua's example. Uh, I'd like to look at Yahshua's example. And in Luke 2.40, we see that Yahshua, when he was a child, uh, he went with his parents to Jerusalem every year to the Passover. All right, we're not going to look these up. These are just some more to jot down. In John 6, verse 4, he's at Passover as a man. Let me assure you that when Yahshua went to the Passover, they were eating lambs and goats. Not tofu. And of course, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the evening before he was impaled. Some people say that Yahshua did not even eat the Passover. Let's see. Our first witness that we're going to look at doesn't exactly say Passover, but remember... I'm sorry, it does not exactly say lamb. It says Passover. But remember, in, in, uh, to the Hebrew, they were used interchangeably like a while ago when we said it is the Passover slaughtering. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And... Verse 17, it says, And on the first day of unleavened bread, the taught ones came to Yahshua, saying to him, Where do you wish for us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is, is near. I am to observe the practice Seder at your house with my taught ones. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't say the practice Seder. See, a lot of people say this is a practice Seder. We'll, we'll get into that in another message. Uh, Yahshua says, I am to observe the Passover at your house with my taught ones. Was he, was he just pulling their legs, or was, he, or, or was he mistaken, or do you think he intended to eat the Passover there? He's going to eat Passover. Okay. And the taught ones did as Yahshua had ordered them and prepared the Passover. Right? And when evening came, he sat down with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you shall deliver me up. All right, skipping uh, on down to verse 26. Um, and I want you to notice what he does to the bread and the wine. And he does this in all three of what they call the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as they were eating, Yahshua took bread, and having blessed, he broke and gave it to the taught ones and said, Take, eat. 
This is my body. And taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, that of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I shall certainly not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in the reign of my Father. I want you to remember that he says fruit of the vine. All right, Mark chapter 14. Mark 14. And we're going to start reading in verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they were slaughtering, what are those, those next two words? The what? Passover lamb. When they were slaughtering the Passover lamb, his taught ones came, uh, his taught ones said to him, Where do you wish for us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Who was slaughtering the lamb? It looks like it may have been his taught ones. And he went out, uh, and he sent out two of his taught ones and said to them, Go into the city, and there uh, a man uh, uh, bearing a jar of water shall meet you, and follow him. And wherever he enters, say to, the master, uh, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I am to eat the Passover with my taught ones? You sound pretty sure about that? I am to eat the Passover with my taught ones, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished, ready, prepare for us there. And his taught ones went out and came to, uh, into the city and found it as he had uh, said to them, and they prepared the Passover. And evening having come, he came with the twelve, and as they sat and ate, Yeshua said, Truly I say to you, one of you who is eating with me shall deliver me up, and skip down to verse 22 and notice the bread and the wine again. And as they were eating, Yahshua took bread, having blessed, broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, that of the renewed covenant, which is shed for many. Truly I say to you, I shall certainly no more drink of the fruit of the vine till that day when I drink it anew in the reign of Elohim. Right? Luke chapter 22. Verse 7. Starting in verse 7. And the day of unleavened bread came when, they, when the Passover had to be slaughtered. Why? Because it's an everlasting throughout your generations. By all right. And he sent Kepha and Yochanan, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us to eat. And they said to him, Where do you wish for us to prepare? And, and he said to them, See, as you enter into the city, a man shall meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him into the house he enters. And, he shall, uh, and you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I might eat the Passover with my taught ones? And he shall show you a large furnished upper room, prepare it there. And going, they found it as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve emissaries with him, and he said to them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before my suffering. For I say to you, I shall certainly not eat of it again until it is filled in the rain of the heavens. Wait a minute. Did he just say that it would be filled? I'm sorry, the rain of Elohim, excuse me. Did he not just say that it would be fulfilled in the rain of Elohim at a, at a later time? And that he would eat of it again then? Did he not just say that? Would this statement of Yahshua not lend, uh, lead one to believe that <clears throat> what was about to happen to him was about something else, maybe? And, and, 
and not a fulfillment of Passover? Wait a minute, is this a stretch? Don't think so. Evidently, what was about to happen to him did not fill it full. It's going to be fulfilled or filled at a later time. Verse 17, 22, 17. And taking the cup and giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I shall certainly not drink of the fruit of the vine until the reign of Elohim comes. And taking the lamb and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for... Yours doesn't say the, taking the lamb. I got, I got to wear these more. <laughs> and taking the bread and giving thanks. He broke it and gave it, not the lamb, different it, to them saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise the cup also. After supper, saying, This cup is the renewed covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Where's Yahshua's reference to him being the lamb in this meal? Let me say it again. Where is Yahshua's reference to him being that lamb in this meal? Did he not just miss a great opportunity to type himself to the Passover lamb? Yeah. Man. He was so sharp, how did he miss that? Yahshua was awesome at visual illustrations. Just think about the parables. How he tied everything so succinctly, you know, when he was, when he was given, a, given a parable. Why then would he let this wonderful opportunity slip through his fingers like that? Could it be... Is it possible that he never intended for his taught ones to identify him as the Passover lamb? You think? But instead, he went to great lengths to type himself with two other symbols. By the way, if Yahshua is typified by the Passover lamb, then his death only covers the firstborn. Oh, I just saw some eyebrows go up. And if you're not the firstborn, then his, then his death does not cover you. Did you ever think of that? What was... Can't wait for Monday. <laughs> I don't like the way that sounds, Stan. Hey, I told you. This is how they remezzed up Passover. This is how they remezzed up Passover and spiritualized with spiritual lies. That's a victory, okay? Next point. Yeshua did not teach against all traditions. He only taught against those traditions which, what? Nullify the commands of Elohim. He went to Jerusalem during Hanukkah. Hanukkah is not commanded. He never condemned it. Where are the instructions in the Torah for wedding festivals? There are none. Wedding traditions are man-made. Yet Yahshua attended them, and he even used them in his parables. Do you remember that I asked you to notice that Yahshua was blessing the bread and giving uh, thanks for the fruit of the vine separately from one another? Could Yahshua have been, been participating in a Jewish tradition here? You see, sometimes when folks who come out of Christianity, as most of us have, 
read something like this, we gloss right over it and don't even realize what we've, what we've just read. But a person raised in Judaism will spot something right off the bat because it's commonplace for them. Is it possible that what Yahshua was doing here is what is called the Hamotzi and the Kiddush? Right? Just for consideration, I'd like for you to think about this. You see, there's a tradition that Jewish folks still do today on the Shabbat, on the high days, when they come together to fellowship. Part of the fellowship is a tradition mentioned in the Scripture that has taught us Western folks to say, Let's get together and break bread. When what we, what we really mean is, let's have a meal for fellowship. It's called Hamotzi and Kiddush. The leader of the, of the house or the, or the gathering will take bread and say, in Hebrew, of, of course, and they don't say Yahweh, they say Adonai, but Yahshua revealed his name, his father's name to his taught ones. I want to say this to you real quick. If Yeshua has revealed his father's name to you, you're in a special class of people. Jot that down and put it back somewhere. If Yeshua has revealed his father's name to you, you're in a special class of people. <clears throat> and they will say, Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, ruler of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. They may not realize it, but they may actually be talking about Yahshua and don't know it because that was the only sign that was given as Jonah was in the belly of the earth, I mean belly of the well for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. He then breaks the bread and he hands it to everyone around the table just like somebody else did. And, and likewise, but separately, just like Yahshua, he will take the cup and say, Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, or ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, just as Yahshua did. Interestingly, when they are asking this blessing on the cup, they don't say, Blessed are you, O Yahweh, who brings forth the yain, the wine. They don't say that. Those are not the words they use. They say, Blessed are you, O Yahweh, or Elohim, ruler of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. What's the big deal about that? The word wine is used multiple times, many times, in the Messianic writings. The words fruit of the vine occur only three times. And guess where every single one of these incidences occur? Every single time, is once in Matthew, once in Mark, once in Luke, it occurs when Yahshua is performing this blessing on the cup before he gives it to those sitting around the table with him. Is that just not the most awesome coincidence? That when Yahshua, a Jew, living in Judah, raised in a Jewish community, going to the Jewish synagogue, worshiping with Jews at the synagogue, speaking Aramaic and Hebrew, who came for the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael, would, without speaking a single word, Replace the everlasting commands of Yahweh concerning the Passover with something as common in Jewish society as hugging your loved ones when they come by for a visit. Isn't that awesome? When you look at it that way, is that not one of the craziest things that you have ever heard? What Yahshua did that night was one of those things familiar to a Jew but unrealized by a person raised in a culture absent from all things Jewish. And heck, don't you think if Yahshua was doing something as monumental as changing the Passover, that one of these guys would have at least given it a little attention? But none of them say anything 
about any change like that. And you know what? John doesn't even mention the event at all. Let me say that again. They want us to believe that this event replaced the Passover, and John doesn't even find it relevant enough to include it in his account that evening at all. Really? How could all these guys have missed something as eventful as that? That's a good question there, Stan. Things that make you go, how? Hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to embellish this just a little bit here for the purpose of supposition only. Maybe the intent of what was going on that night was something like this. Brothers, our time together has meant so very much to me. But things are about to change and they're about to get very intense. You see, I'm about to be delivered up. And I'm going to give my life for you. I'm going to miss you more than you'll ever know. I would desperately love to be here with you, but I cannot. So what I would like is whenever you get together to fellowship and break bread with one another at these appointed times, these times that have come to mean so much to me, they're so special. I would really appreciate it is when you do this, if you would remember me. Would you do this in remembrance of me? Could it be that Yahshua was not adding something to the Torah, but rather applying these symbols not to Passover, but that any time that his followers get together to fellowship at Yahweh's appointed times, that they do it to remember him. I think this makes a lot more sense than to say that Yahshua changed the everlasting commands of Yahweh without so much as a word indicating that that's what he was doing, don't you? How about you folks at home? Look it up on the internet, Hamotzi. Kiddush, if you're not familiar with it, it's what Jews do. <clears throat> Most of us have been taught that we should no longer kill a goat or a lamb at Passover because Yahshua is the lamb now, and that would minimize his sacrifice, he, even though Passover is not about sin. For the sake of changing the perfect Torah of Yahweh, we, we are all familiar with the ways that, that we've been taught to type Yahshua to the lamb. I mean, he was without blemish, not a bone broken. Killed at the exact moment that the Passover lamb was being slaughtered, which we learned a while ago wasn't exactly truth. That's what we were taught. But let us not turn a blind eye to the things that don't line up for change. His body was not roasted, nor burned up that night. Even the bread that he said was his body was surely baked. I mean, baked. Where in the Torah does it say to blindfold the lamb, to strike it in the face, beat the lamb to a bloody pulp, take a cat of nine tails and rip the flesh from its bones, spit on it, pull the hair out of its face, shear it, strip it naked, puncture its head with thorns, Hang it on a stake. Stab it with a spear. Mock it and laugh at it while it suffers and dies. By the way, I would say Yahshua was probably pretty blemished. Yet all of this happened to Yahshua. But wait, there's more. According to the Torah, who was supposed to kill the Passover lamb? All of Israel who killed Yahshua. Yes, we all have a hand in his death. But who actually performed the slaughter of our Messiah? Okay? Some Jews, not all. 
because remember he had followers some Jews not all had him arrested on false charges and that's what happened but who performed the slaughter all Israel the priesthood Yahshua was slaughtered by what did you say Hubert sun worshiping uncircumcised heathen pagan whatever you want to call it Roman soldiers not Israel now Exodus 12 48 says that the uncircumcised weren't even supposed to come near much less perform the slaughter now some might say well the Jews couldn't kill him because they were under Jewish rule I'm sorry, Roman rule, thank you. They couldn't do it because they were under Roman rule. And I say, really? That didn't seem to stop them from killing Stephen, did it? Dun, dun, dun. It, it, it didn't stop them ki killing Stephen. And the, and the Jews, the Yehudim, took up stones to stone Yahshua on two occasions in John chapter 8 and John chapter 10, and Yahshua escaped. But they didn't seem to be any any fear of Roman soldiers when, when they, they were going to stone Yahshua. Amen? So that stuff about they couldn't kill him because of the Romans is, you know what? Hooey. They killed people when they wanted to kill people. Even if it was the case, guess what? It doesn't matter. You know why? The fact is that Yisrael did not perform the slaughter. He was slaughtered by the uncircumcised. End of point. Regardless. Please do not infer that I, that I am saying that Yahshua is not our Passover. I believe that he typifies, Passo typifies Passover and much, much more. Interestingly, at each one of Yahweh's set-apart days, there is a male goat. Oh, he's a lamb, though. There is a male goat to atone for your sin. I'm simply saying that there are too many conflicting circumstances concerning Yahshua's death to conclude that he took the place of the Torah concerning the practice of Yisrael killing the Passover, which Yahweh said was an everlasting law and teach our children that we don't have to do that anymore because it's all about Yahshua now. Yahshua never said that. But didn't Paul say that Yahshua is the Passover now? At the risk of making Paul least in the kingdom of heaven, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and start in verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5. In verse 7 says, Therefore, cleanse out the old leaven, so that you are a new lump, as you are unleavened. For also Messiah, our Passover, was offered for us. So then, let us observe the festival, not with the old leaven, nor the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Is this visual, symbolic, metaphoric language? Yes, it is. And he tells you to observe it. You are not a lump of dough. This is not to be taken literally. Also, where in this passage is Paul's instruction to end the everlasting, forever, throughout your generations Torah concerning killing the Passover? It's not there. Paul didn't instruct you to start doing one thing and do something different. It is sophistry to presume that this passage suggests that we must stop keeping the Torah. If it were, it would be against the testimony and witness of Yahshua Messiah. Amen. And do you know what Paul said just a few verses before? He makes the comment about the dough lumps. In Messiah, our Passover, 
This is the other one I'd like for you to highlight if you don't have it. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. And Paul said, In these matters, brothers, I have applied in a figure to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you might learn not to think beyond what is written, so that none of you be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Did you see that? Highlight that. So that, you, so that in us you might learn not to think beyond what is written. There, there is nowhere in the Scripture where it is written that the Passover has been done away with or changed by Yahshua or anyone else for that matter. In order to come up with that, you have to think beyond what is written. Amen? The last thing that we're going to look at in our Scripture is something that is not the inspired word of Elohim. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. I'm sorry, the next thing that's got, got a couple other things to look at. All right, Matthew chapter 1. All right, now back up one page and tell me what you see. The Messianic Scriptures. If you're, if you're looking at the King James or some other version, you're going to see a, a page that says the New Testament. All right. That page right there was put in there by man. And it's not the authorized word of Elohim. This man-made edition has muddied the water. Some people think that everything to the right of that page is not binding. I mean, it's binding for today, and everything that's on the left side of that page has been done away with or changed. Now, I've got a flash for you. The Elohim that said everlasting on the right side of that page is the same Elohim that said everlasting on the left-hand side of that page. And if you can't count on him to mean business when he said everlasting on the left-hand side of that page, then neither can you count on him when he says everlasting on the right-hand side of that page. And you might as well fold up this book right here and throw it in a trash can. <laughs> so I have a challenge for anyone who will take it. Where the Scripture makes distinction, can you show even one single solitary witness of anyone having Passover that did not include a literal goat or lamb? Okay? I'm talking about a genuine, four-legged, bleating before they were eaten, goat or lamb. No one will take me up on this challenge. And you know why? Because it's not there. It'd be like asking somebody to show where Yahshua went into the church to teach Sunday school on Sunday. It's not there. There's no evidence of anyone in Scripture ever having a lambless goat it, or goat, having a lambless or goatless Passover. That's what makes it the Passover. And if the practice of not slaughtering is nowhere to be found in the Scripture, well, you know what that sort of makes it? It, it sort of makes it unscriptural, doesn't it? You can use that Monday too. Man will reject Yahshua's clear instruction to us. He will say, Yahshua did do away with the Torah, or he changed it, or, the, uh, or he is the, the lamb because Paul said dot, dot, dot. Since Yahshua said that he did not come to do away with anything, and that, and that would include change the old for new, since he told you not to even think such a thing, since he told you heaven and earth would pass away before one jot or tittle would fall from the Torah. And killing the Passover is not a jot or tittle, but it's a chunk. Since this was his witness and testimony to us, since Paul nor any of Yahshua's taught ones ever said to stop, and if they did, that would make them least in the reign of the heavens, according to the testimony of Yahshua Messiah, since Yahweh says that it's everlasting forever throughout your generations, and when your children ask, 
This is what you are to tell them. And since the practice of not killing the lamb is an unscriptural practice, from where did man think to get this idea and from what authority? It didn't come from Yahweh, it didn't come from Yahshua, it didn't come from the prophets, it didn't come from the taught ones. Who else is left? Could it be Satan? Yahweh says, kill the goat or the lamb. It is the Passover. If Yahweh calls it the Passover, how can you leave that part out and still call it Passover? The answer is you can't. Man says this minimizes Yahshua's example. I'm sorry, minimizes Yahshua's sacrifice. Does this minimize Yahshua's sacrifice or does it maximize his example? Maximizes his example. If it maximizes his example, then how in the world could it minimize his sacrifice? First John 2.6 says, The one who says he stays in him ought himself to walk, even as he walked. People may try to call it whatever they might, but can it really be the Passover without performing the Passover slaughtering of the Passover goat or lamb as Yahweh commanded and as Yahshua did all his life. It'd sort of be like trying to go out and perform an immersion without any water. Since the instruction to stop this is nowhere to be found in the Scripture, the answer has to be no. It cannot be Passover without it. Do we walk as he walked or do we walk another way? Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to obey? Who are you going to believe? Every single example that you can find in Scripture or some man that says, you shouldn't do that because it's offensive to Yahweh. And I have another challenge to these ministers who teach people that this very imperative command of Yahweh has been changed because of Yahshua. I don't want to hear your man-made human reasonings or why we don't have to keep it. I don't want to hear your lofty platitudes and your symbolism and your typing and your shadowing and your remezzing. The word of Yahweh is clear about this command. How it's supposed to be kept. And the level of perpetuity with which it's been instituted. My challenge to you is to show clear scriptural evidence that this there's been a change. Because if you cannot, you need to stop teaching the people not to follow Yahshua's example. You need to stop teaching the people not to follow Yahshua's example. Because that's exactly what you're doing. Amen? You are breaking and teaching to break the commands of Elohim. You are making Yahshua a liar. And you are nullifying the commands of Elohim because of your tradition. And if you have no clear scriptural instruction to show that the scriptural observance of the Passover is not for Yahweh's people today, then you're standing on no scriptural authority. You need to sit down and be quiet. You teach the people this, that it's been done away with because of your Christian imagery, your symbolism, your emotive language, your remez, your sowed, but the word of Yahweh clearly teaches the opposite. It is everlasting. The sword is coming and you did not warn the people. Our last scripture today is Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to start in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Because the gate is narrow, 
and the way is hard pressed, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. But beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are savage wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every good tree yields good fruit, but a rotten tree yields wicked fruit. A good tree is unable to yield wicked fruit, and a rotten tree to yield good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter into the reign of the heavens, but he who is doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. If you drink, I'm sorry, if you eat unleavened bread and drink wine to Yahshua as your Passover observance, you are not observing Passover. You are do, doing something that is not Passover and calling it Passover. Huh? Let me say that again. You are not observing Passover. You are doing something that is not Passover and calling it Passover. It's no different than observing Saturday, which is not, the, I'm sorry, it's no different than observing Sunday, which is not the Sabbath, and calling it the Sabbath. It is a counterfeit and a lie. It's no different than taking meat that Yahweh says we are to abominate and declaring it clean simply because we pray to Yahweh and ask Him to bless the abomination before we eat it. It is a counterfeit and a lie. It's no different than taking some pagan practice or high day that Yahweh has commanded us not to observe because He hates everything that they do changing the imagery associated with it, and presto changeo, this pagan practice becomes an observance that man believes is adored in the sight of Yahweh. It is a counterfeit, and it is a lie. It is the oldest trick in the book. Just like Hawa, or with Hawa, Hasatan, deceives you into believing a reason to transgress the command so that you think the transgression is more pleasing than the obedience. You might as well go out and hide some resurrection eggs for the kids. You could even give them some, some little loaves and fishes baskets to go around and collect the resurrection eggs in. You tell me what the difference is. The sad thing is, 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 is is there's probably someone who's going to think, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Little loaves and fishes baskets. I hadn't thought of that. <clears throat> there are those who want you to believe in a transparent illusion veiled in a smoke screen. And I've given you clear scripture There are those who will tell you, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Yahweh says forever, everlasting, throughout your generations, bind it to your hand between your eyes and teach it to your children. We can do what Yahweh says, or we can spiritualize those spiritual lies till Passover is all remezzed up. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his complete control.